Many people have been fascinated by stories of great cities swallowed up by the sea. Once flourishing civilizations, now ruins beneath the waters. I'm fascinated by those stories too, and even more so by archaeological evidence suggesting that such stories might be true. Unlike Atlantis, the remains of which have never been found, there is a legendary city whose remains have been found in the depths, and that is the ancient Indian city of Dwaraka. In this video, we're going to take a deep dive, pun fully intended, into the subject of Dwaraka and look at the historical truth behind the story and when it all happened. You may have heard about Dwarka on the internet somewhere. There are a number of videos on this mysterious ancient city, some of which make some astounding claims about it. We're going to look at one notable one in English from the Ancient Astronaut Archive channel called Dwarka, Krishna's Lost City Discovered, which to date has garnered over 225,000 views. Those who know me may be surprised to find out that I'm not going to be arguing that Dwarka never existed and that the legend is a complete fiction. Oh no. I think it is very well possible that it existed. Just like Troy, the stories about which, although greatly embellished and full of fantasies, was found to have existed, so too Dwaraka, the city that sank beneath the sea, I think could have existed. Let's listen in. I won't be watching the whole video with you. Not all of it needs commentary. I will leave a link below though if you want to see the original. Until recently, the very existence of the city of Dwarka was relegated to the category of myth. Or legend, yes, that's true. But today, archaeologists and historians have not ruled out the possibility that the ancient city of Dwarka once existed and later was submerged beneath the sea. One prominent archaeologist even claimed to have discovered it. Um, I think we need to differentiate between the modern city of Dwarka, which exists today, and the ancient city, which doesn't. From what I've seen, the ancient city is generally spelled D-V-A-R-A-K-A, -A -A, Dwarka. And I think that's so we don't get the two confused. But ancient texts are not consistent on this, and sometimes you'll see it called Dwarawati. There are numerous legends about the city. The most prominent one is found in the ancient epic of the Mahabharata. It is well established that events described in the epic took place at around 3100 BCE. Dwarka is indeed mentioned in the Mahabharata, but the date that he puts on it, 3100 BCE, is not well established. Or maybe I should say it's not well established by archaeological or historical scholarship. The date he gives is the date of popular tradition, the legendary date of the famed Kurukshetra War, the main event of the Mahabharata. If you go and do some research, you'll find that the exact date of the war is disputed, and most scholars place it later in history than 3100, usually in the middle of the second millennium BCE, around 1500 BCE or so. And as we shall see, the remains of Dwaraka add weight to this date. I should add as an aside that anyone interested in placing the submergence of Dwaraka at the time of a flood caused by a presumed Younger Dryas Comet impact is certainly not going to want to accept even the date of 3100 BCE for the founding of the city. That is thousands of years too late for that. In other words, if you want to connect the submergence of Dwaraka to the Mahabharata, you cannot simultaneously connect it with the rise of sea level back in the Younger Dryas period. It's got to be one or the other, or neither. According to tradition and ancient texts, Dwaraka, or Dwarawati, was built by Krishna near a place called Kusasali, which was a city that had fallen into ruin. Krishna makes his first appearance in the Mahabharata as king of Dwaraka. Three principal sources which contain accounts of Krishna can be examined. They are the Mahabharata, written between the 3rd century BCE and the 3rd century CE, or thereabouts. The Harivamsha, written somewhere between the 2nd century BCE and the 5th century CE. And the Puranas, written between the 3rd and 10th century CE. Dwarka also is mentioned in the early Tamil works, the hymns of the Alvars and the Nalayira Divya Prabandham, between the 4th and 9th century CE and the Silapatikaram between the 5th and 6th century CE. Among all these sources, the Mahabharata is the earliest and is a text that contains what appears to be a great deal of historical information. 
the Harivamsha is an appendix to the Mahabharata, and the Puranas tend to be the accounts of traditions passed down from generation to generation. The Mahabharata gives many detailed descriptions of the ancient glorious city. Quote, the city was filled with the sounds of birds and bees flying about the parks and pleasure gardens, while its lakes, crowded with blooming lotuses, resounded with the calls of swans and cranes. Dwarka boasted 900,000 royal palaces, all constructed with crystal and silver and splendorously decorated with huge emeralds. Inside these palaces, the furnishings were bedecked with gold and jewels. Traffic moved along a well-laid-out system of boulevards, roads, intersections, and marketplaces, and many assembly houses and temples of demigods graced the charming city. The roads, courtyards, commercial streets, and residential patios were all sprinkled with water and shaded from the sun's heat by banners waving from flagpoles. There's plenty of reference in the Mahabharata, Harivamsha, and other texts describing the impregnable character of the city of Dwarka. I think we all can view the mention of 900,000 royal palaces as an extreme exaggeration or figurative expression. The city's unlikely to have had 900,000 total population, much less 900,000 rulers. According to the Bhavagata Purana, Dwarka was attacked by King Salva using his Vimana. The description of the battle suggests it was fought with advanced technology and weapons, potentially even with a craft attacking from orbit. The spacecraft commenced an attack on the city with the use of energy weapons, which to the onlookers resembled a discharge of lightning, and it was so devastating that after the attack, most of the city lay in ruins. He besieged the city with a large army, O best of the Baradas, disseminating the outlying parks and gardens, the mansions along with their observatories, towering gateways and surrounding walls, and also the public recreation areas. From his excellent Vimana, he threw down a torrent of projectiles. A fierce vortex arose and blanketed the entire area with billowing dust. Lord Krishna counterattacked and fired his weapons on the ship. They looked like arrows, yet they roared like thunder and shone like rays of the sun when released. This description sounds more like a modern-day missile. Um, do I need to comment on this? This is just a matter of reading an ancient text as science fiction. The Bhagavata Purana doesn't say anything about spacecraft or energy weapons. That's just reading into the text something that isn't there. According to the Mahabharata, the city was flooded and submerged by the Arabian Sea. The sea, which has been beating against the shores, suddenly broke the boundary that was imposed on it by nature. It rushed into the city, coursing through the beautiful city streets, and covered up everything in the city. I saw the beautiful buildings becoming submerged one by one. In a matter of a few moments, it was all over. The sea had now become as placid as a lake. There was no trace of the city. Dwarka was just a name, just a memory. The Vishnu Purana also mentions the submersion of Dwarka, stating, on the same day that Krishna departed from the earth, the powerful dark-bodied Kali Age, the Age of Vice, descended. The oceans rose and submerged the whole of Dwarka. It may be important to point out that, according to the story, the inhabitants of the city had plenty of time to get out. They walked out prior to the flooding, and all were saved. If you were to research the lost city of Dwarka nowadays, one of the first things you will notice on the internet is a great many articles and blogs that lead you to believe that this was a recent discovery. And in relative terms, one could make that assertion. However, the first excavations began nearly 100 years ago in the 1930s, around the island of Bet Dwarka, which is about 30 kilometers north of the modern-day Dwarka. Yes, because there was and is a city of Dwarka currently in existence, in Okamandal, in the Jamnagar district, it had long been thought that the ancient city was somewhere in that area. Most ancient texts refer to ancient Dwarka being close to the sea, and the Puranas say that it hugged the west coast, where the Gomati River joins the sea. More excavations were conducted in the 1960s, but yielded no conclusive results. Yes, archaeologist Hasmuk Sankalia, with a team from Deccan College, excavated a trench not far away from Dwakardish Temple in the city, and came to the conclusion that 
The foundation of the first Dwarka might be placed at a period just before or around the beginning of the Christian era, but not much earlier. There was more to be found, however. In his work, The Lost City of Dwarka, Dr. Rao outlined the scientific details of these discoveries and artifacts. According to him, the clue to the existence of ancient Dwarka near the modern town of Dwarka was found during archaeological excavation near the Dord Kadish Temple in 1979 and 80. Eroded debris and pottery provided evidence of a port town destroyed by sea about 3,500 years ago. This evidence is what led to the early excavations in the Arabian Sea near the mouth of the Gamadi River, where the modern town of Dwarka stands. In 1979 and 1980, more excavation was done at the Dwarkadish Temple in the city. The temple itself dates to between the 13th and 15th centuries CE. But beneath, they found the remnants of three earlier temples. The earliest from the 1st century, the second from the 4th century, and the third from the 9th century. Further down, below the first temple, at around 10 meters deep, was a highly eroded deposit showing the existence of a settlement with what we call lustrous redware pottery. In Gujarat, lustrous redware is a primary marker of the post-urban Harappan time period. Its date range is estimated to be between 1900 and 1400 BCE, based on radiocarbon determinations from nearby sites. And evidence indicated that the settlement at Dwarka that had this pottery was destroyed by the sea. After its destruction, there was a gap in occupation for about a thousand years. This discovery led to suppositions that the settlement that was destroyed might have been the original city that was the inspiration for the legend of the sunken city of Krishna. In the 1980s, Dr. S. R. Rao with the Marine Archaeology Unit of the National Institute of Oceanography undertook an extensive search of the city along the coast and finally succeeded in finding it off the Gujarat coast. Yes, the finds near Dwakardish Temple motivated funding for additional archaeological work under the oversight of archaeologist Shikaripura Ranganatha Rao, who had done the excavation at the temple. The Indian Science Academy and the Department of Science and Technology funded the work of underwater exploration, with logistical support provided by the National Institute of Oceanography. Beginning in 1982, and based on promising data that had been collected, investigations began at the island of Bet Dwarka off the coast, also known as Shankodara. A survey of the coastline of the island at the southern part of the eastern shore revealed remnants of a massive rubble wall. The pottery collected from there was dated to 3,520 years before present by thermoluminescence dating indicating that the pottery came from the 16th century BCE. Traces of early settlement were also found in the central region on the eastern shore in the form of remnants of a massive rubble wall exposed during the low tide. Nine courses of masonry were found almost intact. To the south, two rock-cut slipway-like features were probably used for the launching of boats. A wall-like structure submerged in the area further north in Balapur Bay was visible about a kilometer out to sea. These structural remains suggested the existence of an ancient port town, about four kilometers long and a half a kilometer to a kilometer wide, with three distinct sectors on the eastern coast of the island. Rao identified the island as Kusasthali, the place mentioned in the Mahabharata, near where Krishna chose to build Dwaraka. Artifacts Rao found there suggested that the site was first settled in the late Harappan period, around 1800 BCE. More recent thermoluminescence dating of the pottery on the island show continuous habitation from that time until the medieval period. But the people did have to deal with rising and falling sea levels. Between 1983 and 1990, the well-fortified township of Dwarka was discovered, extending more than half a mile from the shore. Dwarka extended up to Bet Dwarka in the north and Okamadi in the south. Eastward, it extended up to Pindera. Despite the fine discoveries at the island, Rao identified Dwaraka, the legendary city of Krishna, with the remains that he found underwater off the mainland. Marine exploration conducted between 1983 and 1994 showed the ruins of a port city that once stood at the mouth of the Gomati River. The submerged channel of the river could be traced to a distance of one and a half kilometers from the Samudra Narayana temple out to sea. It probably extended somewhat further. 
What the archaeological team discovered were inner and outer fortification walls with a gateway complex. An outer gateway leads to the open sea and the inner one to the river Gomati. Remnants of a stone jetty were located too. The outer walls were constructed with large dressed stone blocks. They remain in situ up to one to two meters in height. Smaller stones used for buildings were spread out due to the action of the waves and the current. Rectangular enclosures built of large dressed sandstone blocks were also found. These enclosures could have been part of port structures. Circular bastions were built around the corners to protect against the force of the sea. A large number of three-holed triangular stone anchors lying on the seabed along these walls confirm that the harbor area was probably used for anchoring boats. Rao believed that these remains were from two different periods of time. The first period of habitation, he asserted, was relatively short, 1500 to 1400 BCE, when the city of Dwarka was built during the second urbanization of India, the first being the urbanization of the Harappans. This would have been the time when the lustrous redware pottery found at, at Dwarka and below the temple at Dwarka would have been made. The structures of this period he identified with the ones that were in situ at about six meters below sea level. The three-hold triangular stone anchors, he said, were similar to the ones used in the late Bronze Age sites of Kidion and Syria in the 14th to 12th centuries BCE. Rao identified a second period of habitation between 100 BCE and 500 CE on the basis of red polished and associated wares, which were in situ at 2.82 meters below sea level. Artifacts from this period include iron anchors. The general layout of the city of Dwarka described in ancient text agrees with that of the submerged city discovered by the MAU. Dwarka was supposed to have been built on six blocks two on the right bank and four on the left. All the six sectors had protective walls built of dressed stones of sandstone. Whatever has been traced so far conforms to the description of Dwarka in the Mahabharata to a large extent. But here's the problem. More recent work done in the area has called into question Rao's identification of the underwater remains as originating in the 16th century BCE. No significant amount of lustrous redware was located there, which would have served to confirm the dating. And the triangular stone anchors have been examined and determined to be from medieval times. Moreover, the remains have been identified as belonging almost exclusively to a stone jetty and do not include residences. Yes, I found this a bit disappointing, but there it is. It would appear that the underwater structures are not as old as Rao believed. I took a look at a television program hosted by Graham Hancock, which came out in 2002 called Underworld, Flooded Kingdoms of the Ice Age, because it covered the subject of Dwarka and I wanted to see what Hancock had to say about it. It turns out that Hancock is very interested in discrediting Rao's finds, because he doesn't want Dwarka to have existed in historic times. He wants it to be thousands of years older. So in the show, he interviews some scientists from the NIO so that he may dismiss the idea that there was an ancient city at Dwarka in post-urban Harappan times. In the 1980s, the Dwarka flood myth received a boost when ruins immediately presumed to be those of the lost city of Krishna were discovered in the bay in front of the temple. A leading archaeologist estimated on the basis of a hunch that they were dated to around 1500 BC. But since there's no real evidence for that date, I want to take a look at them myself. A group of marine archaeologists from India's National Institute of Oceanography have agreed to take me diving at Dwarka. This is Dwarka. Yeah. So we're moored over this concentration yeah. of ruins. So are these mainly individual blocks? Or are they no, individual boys which we tied for the particular structure. I see. Okay. So now the blocks are scattered. Yes. I'm working with marine archaeologists Sri Sundaresh and Dr. Gaur. What's hard looking at structures underwater is to be sure whether strange looking objects are just weird natural formations or whether they've been cut and shaped by man. It becomes clearer when you find clean cut individual blocks like these. The next question with any underwater site is, how old is it? 
This site is so shallow and close to the shore that recent earthquakes could have submerged it, not necessarily rising sea levels at the end of the Ice Age. So it wasn't a big surprise to learn that Sundaresh and Gaur are now dismissing these finds that are merely hundreds of years old. This clearly can't be the ruins of the ancient mythical city of Dwarka. Stone anchors of a type made in India in the Middle Ages prove that the ships of that time once moored here. So anchors uh, precisely we are dating between 8th century AD to 14th century AD. Mm -hmm. So I think its structure also may, be fall, may fall in that period. So we're talking actually yeah. about a medieval yeah, site? Yeah, medieval period. Do you accept the conventional dating of 1500 BC or so for this site, or do you think we should put a big question mark over that date? I think, you, of, I think you have answered the question. <laughs> we should put a big question mark over yeah, that. I mean, we have not found any material evidence on which we can be sure about the date. Right. Uh, till we find uh, any datable uh, uh, material artifact, yeah. we'll have to continue our search as and when we can. Yeah. Notice how Hancock dismisses Rao's conclusions by saying they were based on a hunch, which is untrue. He centers attention on the underwater remains at the mouth of the Gomati River, but glosses over the fact that Rao had discovered remains, including lustrous redware, below the Dwakardish temple which itself is evidence for the existence of a settlement there in the post-urban Harappan period. Now yes, without the inclusion of the submerged structures, we can no longer say it was a city or had fortifications. I mean, it may have been, but there's still no evidence for that. But we can say that people lived here. There was an ancient settlement here, and it was destroyed by the sea. So it would seem that the existence and the subsequent submergence of Dwarka is real and not fictional. If there is any historical truth to the tale about Krishna building the city, this would date Krishna, and therefore the Kurukshetra War, to the middle of the second millennium BCE. In 2001, the students of the Institute of Oceanography Technology were commissioned by the Indian government to do a survey on pollution in the Gulf of Combat, seven miles from the shore. To be clear, the Gulf of Combat, formerly known as the Gulf of Cambay, is a few hundred kilometers distant from Dwarka. It's sometimes brought into the discussion because there are claims that another submerged settlement was found there, and since it's not that far away from Dwarka, the evidence it provides could have a bearing on the history of Dwarka. In December 2000, the National Institute of Ocean Technology, or NIOT for short, were performing a routine pollution study with sonar when they ran across what appeared to be regularly spaced geometric structures at a depth of about 30 to 40 meters. That's pretty deep. Comments were made at the time that they kind of resembled the ruins of Harappan cities, though initially nothing had been dated. S.R. Rao, who had worked on Dwarka, commented that the only conclusive way of establishing the antiquity of the site would be to study pieces of submerged pottery from the same area. During the survey, they found buildings made of stones covered in mud and sand covering five square miles. Divers collected blocks, samples, artifacts, and copper coins, which scientists believe is the evidence from an age that is about 3,600 years old. Such a date puts it squarely in the same time period as the earliest ruins of Dwarka. However, the remains found here were not like the remains found at Dwarka. There was no archaeological excavation, and the existence of buildings there has never been confirmed by any pair of human eyes. No photographs of the presumed buildings have ever been taken. All we have are sonar images. Sonar images are not like photographs, and a non-expert like you or me might be fooled into interpreting an image as if it were a perspective snapshot as viewed from a particular vantage point. But the apparent shape of supposed objects in the image depends on the ship's speed, the lateral range of the sonar beam on each side, and the speed of the paper in the printer. As far as I know, none of that data was provided, so the shapes shown on the screen of the scans could very well be coincidental illusion. This may not be all that different from the face of Mars image that NASA took, which led to speculations about a civilization on the red planet. One thing that I've encountered many times in my studies of these subjects is how common it is for non-specialists to confuse natural concretions with human-made objects. 
From what I understand, although they had the GPS coordinates for where the original sonar survey was conducted, no one has been able to replicate their sonar images or find the structures they claim to have discovered. This was explained away as the result of shifting sand burying the structures. But it could equally be explained as the result of the random nature of the shapes in the images caused by glitches in sonar gear and software used to process the data. Some of the samples were sent to Manipur and Oxford universities for carbon dating, and the results created more suspicion since some of the objects were found to be 9,000 years old. He's referring to samples of carbonized wood. One was sent to two labs for carbon dating, uh, one in India and one in Germany. The calibrated age, as per the Indian lab, was 9,580 to 9,190 years before present. And as per the German lab, 9,545 to 9,490 years before present. Another sample of carbonized wood was sent to a different lab in India and came back with the date 8,450 years before present. But here's the thing. The wood was not identifiable as a human-made object, nor was it found in a human-made structure. They were just pieces of wood. And since we know that long ago the area was above sea level and probably had trees growing on it, this is not a smoking gun for a human civilization that far back. The NIOT returned for further investigation in the Gulf from October 2002 to January 2003. During these excavations, the NIOT reported finding two paleo channels flanked by rectangular and square basement-like features. Artifacts were recovered by means of dredging, including pottery shards, microliths, wattle and daub remains, and hearth materials. According to Dr. Bardinarian, chief scientist of the team from NIOT, fired pottery pieces were found that were carbon dated to 31,000 years before the present, which would make it the earliest fired pottery ever found in the world. He wrote in an internet article that his discovery was more likely the real Dwarka, and not the one found by S.R. Rao, saying, probably the metropolis in the Gulf of Cambay could be the Dwarka city of Mahabharata fame. There are two major problems, however, with his conclusion that other scientists and scholars have pointed out. First, the manner in which the artifacts were recovered from the seafloor was done through dredging. This method could easily allow errant artifacts to be collected along with those that truly correlate with the site. Not to mention the fact that it makes analysis of the stratification of the site virtually impossible. The supposed artifacts recovered could have been carried there over the millennia with the tides and currents from other nearby places. There's no way of knowing whether these objects were buried in situ or eroded from coastal or fluvial deposits and transported elsewhere and reburied by tidal currents. Keep in mind too that extensive nautical traffic traversed the Gulf of Cambay over the millennia and surely numerous vessels have sunk. As these ships disintegrated over time under the water, their contents would have released considerable numbers of artifacts of various types and time periods. Second, the NIO team has been accused of interpreting geofacts as artifacts. Dr. Neil Kenyon, a marine geologist, said, quote, the materials dredged up from the Cambay site and presented as human artifacts all appear to be well-known natural geological features and fossils familiar to any sedimentary geologist who has worked in the Indian Ocean, Arabian Sea, or Arabian Gulf region." Unquote. Marine geoarchaeologist Dr. Nicholas Fleming said, quote, "...my immediate impression was that these objects are mostly natural rolled pebbles, concretions, and other normal seabed phenomena. If I had found material like this on the seafloor, I would not have expected the public to believe that they are artifacts." Unquote. In the Graham Hancock documentary I referenced earlier, Hancock is far more interested in the Gulf of Combat finds than in the ruins found at Dwarka because he wants to find something from the Ice Age. Their sonar readings show evidence for two huge cities 120 feet underwater. And a sample they've collected from the seabed has been carbon dated to the end of the Ice Age. The NIOT experts aren't archeologists. They were doing pollution studies in the Thank Gulf, you. but what they found is of massive archaeological significance. Sure. 
Could these flooded cities be the proof I've been looking for which joins the Indian flood myth to archaeology? Initially, when we went, we thought probably we'll be on an early Harappan site. But after seeing all the artifacts and evidences what we have collected, it looks that they are before the Harappan yes. uh, period. Which means, in the end, that history is going to have to be looked at again. Definitely. Maybe this is the beginning of a major uh, discovery for uh, the world. I think so. I think so. It's the scale of the sites which is so exciting. It looks like a twin city or a twin metropolis of right. ancient times. Right. Uh, can have a look here. Wow. This is a treasure trove. Next, Dr. Badranarian took me to see some of the artifacts they've recovered by dredging the underwater sites. Uh, these are our uh, micro tools, yeah. where you can see various uh, shaped uh, thin objects, well polished to use them for uh, various purposes. This is uh, like a spoon. Spoon, huh? yeah. yeah. Uh, you can see it is the shape of a deer they have made. Well, it's very interesting because it's carved the same on both, on both okay. sides. Human remains include a fossilized jawbone and vertebrae. And the artifacts show that these people were skilled in making pottery, jewelry, and other ornaments. This seems to have been almost like turned on some sort yeah, of... Yeah, it is. It, is a, it appears to be a, a very good artifact. Probably they had a sort of hand uh, yeah. instrument to turn all these things. If you see, there's a hole also they are made through that. And, and this hole runs all the way through it? Yeah, completely. Yeah. So this is absolutely, definitively a man-made object. Yeah, we did not know what it was. Most startling of all, a stone slab was discovered with raised markings which could push back the date of the invention of writing to the end of the Ice Age. He makes much out of the so-called artifacts that the NIO team dredged up. But even to my untrained eye, these do not look like objects made by humans to me. What do you think? Let me know your assessment in the comments. As far as I'm aware, nothing has been published in any scientific literature about these artifacts. The only place you can find the images or any discussion is on the internet, in popular books, or on popular TV shows. In my opinion, there is no there there. The archaeological remains near modern Dwarka seem to me to be the most likely candidate for the ancient city of Dwarka mentioned in the Mahabharata. In January 2007, the Underwater Archaeology Wing of the Archaeological Survey of India began excavations at Dwarka yet again. But the work on further excavation has met a formidable roadblock in the form of academic indifference and government apathy. It seems India's central government no longer has much interest in the excavations at Dwarka or the one at the Gulf of Cambay. Well, I can understand why they don't want to spend more money on the Cambay site which at this point seems to have been a sonar mirage. But work on Dwaraka and on many sites on the Gujarat coast has continued until the present day. If not always actual excavation, then survey or lab work. So I don't know what he's talking about when he says there's no longer any interest. Consider the fact that Dwaraka was worked on extensively throughout the 80s and early 90s, and then again in the early 2000s. There are many archeological sites that don't get that much attention. And as far as I know, any area there that had potential was already investigated. Studies have proven that the sea considerably and suddenly rose to submerge the city. The Hari Vamsha describes the submerging of Dwarka, saying, Krishna instructed Arjuna, who was then visiting Dwarka, to evacuate the residents as the sea was going to engulf the city. On the seventh day, as the last of the citizens were leaving the city, the sea entered the streets of Dwarka. What studies? I looked in the notes of his video for links, but none were provided. I searched and searched and couldn't find a single study that proved that the sea considerably and suddenly rose to submerge Dwarka in a week's time. According to experts, there could have been three reasons why the sea entered the land. One, a change in the level of seabed. Two, a massive earthquake. And three, sudden increase in the level of seawater. Of the three, the last is the most plausible. If it was a change in the level of seabed, some remains of the tearing off action on the shore would be visible, which is absent. Earthquake can be ruled out as the structures have not collapsed because of the shake. It should be noted that any flooding associated with the rise of the global sea level would not have flooded a coastal city that quickly. 
So if you want to put historical stock into the legend, the rising global sea level as the cause of the city's submergence would have to be ruled out. On the other hand, scientific investigation has revealed that the sea level has indeed risen locally, based on the structural remains at Dwarka. S.R. Rao calculated that the sea level had risen five to six meters in the last 3,300 years. Other scientific investigations have shown, I'll leave citations below the video, that the sea level in the area has risen and fallen many times, reaching its present day level around 1000 CE. The reasons for the change in sea level are complicated. These could include tectonic disturbances. The island of Bedwarka shows evidence of earthquakes. Coastal erosion. The area around Dwarka is especially prone to coastal erosion, in fact, and other factors. Any or all of these could have affected human habitation. We don't have to conclude that the city was destroyed in a flood suddenly. It may have been abandoned when the sea began to encroach, and then flooding continued in the years after abandonment. The third reason seems most plausible as a similar phenomenon had occurred on the shores of Bahrain around the same time as some recent findings indicate. It is to be noted here that considerable work has been done onshore and offshore in Bahrain, which has indicated trade and other relations between the western coast of India and the coast of present-day Bahrain. There was flooding of the coast of Bahrain around 3500 BCE, but this wasn't at the time that trade was being conducted with India. On the contrary, the earliest kingdom in Bahrain, Dilmun, didn't exist until around 2200 BCE, more than a thousand years later. Trade with India began around then. It may seem surprising that the majority of academia has taken little notice of the findings at Dwarka. In its early days, the project received UNESCO support and several foreign marine archaeologists also offered help. Unfortunately, the government's indifference to the project has kept them away. But, when you consider that this discovery threatens to upend academia's current historical timeline and paradigm, it really is not all that surprising they would choose to ignore it and continue disseminating their own fiction. Where he's getting this from, I don't know. There's plenty of academic literature about Dwarka, which I used to research this video, and which are readily accessible. Nothing is being kept under wraps, and the discoveries more or less fit right into India's historical timeline. If they didn't, the timeline would naturally be revised, as it often is in archaeology. Anyway, I hope you found something valuable in this video. If you did, give it a thumbs up. I hope you'll stick around and check out some other vids. I'll catch you next time. You might like my little e-booklet, Why Ancient History Matters. It's designed to persuade people that the subject is important, even in the modern world. You might also wish to use it to help spread the word. So feel free to share it with someone you know. It's free for anyone who wants it. I've left the link in the description box below the video for you to grab a copy. Catch you later.